Good afternoon, everyone. First thing I'd like to do is uh, to just say that after the meeting, we will have a press conference that will include Ken Frazier, the head of the Special Investigative Committee, myself, and Keith Mosser, and that will be in the Mount Nittany Room. So I would like to welcome the University Faculty Senate officers who are here with us today. And I'd like them to stand to be recognized. Larry Backer, who is the Chair and Professor of Law. Larry, welcome. Brenton Yarnell, who is the Chair-Elect and Professor of uh, Geography. Thank you. Uh, Pam Huffnagel, who is the Secretary, and Pam is the Senior Instructor in Education at Penn State Dubois. Boys, I guess. I say Dubois. <laughs> OK. This is the first meeting for the Senate officers in their respective positions. We look forward to working with all of you over the coming academic year. Thank you. The student representatives are with us at our meetings today. The first one I'd like to introduce is Ben Clark, who is the president of the Council of the Commonwealth Governments. Courtney Lennartz, who is the president of the University Park Undergraduate Association, welcome. And Yannika Fisher, who's the president of the Graduate Student Association. Juanica, excuse me. They were also recently elected, and we look forward to working with you as well. In addition, we'd like to welcome Bobby Corner, Chair of the Academic Leadership Council and Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture. Did Bobby, there's Bobby, welcome. We'll now proceed with the business of the day. I'd like to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones so that we can direct our full attention to the issues before us. I'd like to call the meeting to order, and Mrs. Ammerman, if you would please call the roll. Trustees Alexander? Here. Allen? Here. Arnell? Present. Broadhurst? Here. Clemens? <clears throat> Corbett? Here. Dambly? Here. Devinney? Here. Devera Dennis? Eckel? <coughs> Erickson? Here. Frazier? Here. Garbin? Here. Gregg? Here. Hayes? Here. Hetherington? Here. Hentz? Here. Huber? Here. Jones? Here. Corey? Here. Lubert? Here. Mosser? Here. Myers? Here. Peets? Here. Riley? Schaefer, Here. Silvis, Here. Strumpf, Here. Sui, Here. Surma, Here. Tamales, Here. Brandstetter, Here. Brocious, Here. Coppersmith, Huck, Here. Junker, Here. Robinson, Rowell, Wise, and Wolf. Here. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of the meetings of the board held on March 16th? Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. At this time, I'd like to ask President Erickson to present his informational report. Thank you, Chair Peets, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm pleased that you could join us this afternoon for what is certainly one of the highlights of the academic calendar spring commencement. In keeping with the celebratory nature of the weekend, I have a number of notable accomplishments to share this afternoon. First, I'd like to congratulate Karen Peets, who was honored with the Women's Leadership Council Founders Award by the United Way of New York City. Karen has been a dedicated volunteer and leader for the United Way for many years. This is indeed a well-deserved honor. Congratulations, Karen. <laughs> I also want to recognize Ken Fraser, who was elected to the 2012 class of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Some of the world's most accomplished leaders from academia, business, public affairs, the humanities, and the arts have been elected members of the Academy. And this is fitting recognition for Ken's business, corporate, and philanthropic leadership. Congratulations, Ken. Also, please note that Ken will provide an update a little later on the progress of the Louis Free investigation. Turning to commencement, this weekend Penn State will award nearly 13,000 degrees university-wide, 601 associate degrees, 10,473 baccalaureate degrees, 1,176 master's degrees, 
188 doctoral degrees, 131 medical degrees, and 215 law degrees. Graduation is a great academic achievement, and we're very proud of our students' accomplishments, ambition, and their desire to change the world for the better. I would also like to thank the trustees who will be authorizing the granting of degrees in each of the respective ceremonies this weekend. As the great philosopher Anonymous once said, if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would ever get done. <laughs> this year we've had a flurry of activity in the University Park Admissions Office as the May 1st deadline approached. Many students who have applied to the Commonwealth campuses are still making their decisions and we will continue to accept applications to the campuses throughout the spring and summer. I can provide you with a snapshot of where we stand as of three days ago. Overall, applications for baccalaureate admission are ahead of last year by more than 2%, which will make this another record year for applications received. At this point, we're looking at the largest incoming class at University Park since the record cohort of 2006. Our paid acceptances are up 6% for summer and fall. We do expect the usual summer melt, but we're confident that we will more than meet our enrollment target of 7,200 freshmen at University Park. By all indications, the quality of our incoming class is right on par with recent years. After years of significant aggregate growth in enrollments at our 19 Commonwealth campuses, we're seeing some declines this year in deposits. Paid accepts in aggregate at the campuses are down about 750 students from last year, and a majority of the difference is accounted for by three larger campuses where we expect to close the gap in the coming months. We've had so much going on lately, I thought it might be nice to spend some time talking about the weather. <laughs> this is for you, Joel. <laughs> Especially when the forecast is this bright. A group of 15 Penn State meteorology students recently captured first place in the weather challenge, a North American collegiate weather forecasting competition. During the 20-week forecasting contest, which spanned both fall and spring semesters, students predicted high and low temperatures, precipitation and wind speeds at 10 different cities, including Juneau, Alaska, Hilo, Hawaii, New Orleans, and Erie, Pennsylvania. Penn State's forecasters bested teams from more than 50 other universities, and our Penn State willing, winning forecasters will have their names engraved on the Weather Challenge Trophy, which will reside at Penn State during the 2012-13 academic year. Now I wish to share a story about a simple device, the Tippy Tap, that is having a major impact on public health in rural African communities. This work has already won first place for the Johnson & Johnson Rural Health Care Award and first place in the undergraduate research exhibition. And the students who devised it were the first undergraduates to appear at the Research Unplugged lecture series in downtown State, State College. Che Zhang and Adam Mosa, who, invested, who invented the tippy tap, uh, Che is here today and I'll uh, introduce him in just a minute after we watch a short video. schools to do sort of a survey of all the schools. So we went to these elementary schools in Uganda and what I saw there was that there were these children playing outside, using the bathroom, uh, eating. But the thing that was shocking was that none of these places, these bacterial prone places have a hand washing station for the children to go there and wash their hands, you know, after doing these things. So that really sort of motivated me to, you know, go back to Penn State and start sort of a hand washing campaign involving these low cost devices called Tibby Tabs in order to increase access to hand washing so that these kids, you know, will be able to hand wash and prevent the spread of bacterial diseases which are the, like which is a leading cause of child mortality in the world. Um, I'm hoping to show that through my research that, you know, these TB taps uh, can provide 
a change if implemented correctly, especially in the school setting because there's so much children there. And because children are sort of the, the future. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're trying to instill these hand washing habits in kids and trying to inc have more ways for them to hand wash so that, you know, you know, there's less mortality at that point. So in terms of the future of the TV tab, I definitely see the TV tab being part of a long-term, uh, low-cost strategy that can be used to increase hand washing and stop disease. And the best part of the TV tab is that you don't need for an intervention mm -hmm. in order to build it. It's such a simple device that people can construct it based on simple materials present in their communities. So you don't need someone to go in there for example, and build like a rainwater harvesting tank or like solar panels, which cost a lot of money and a lot of villages can't afford. So we just need to get the idea of the TV tap sort of spread, you know, throughout generations so that it sort of starts in one community and spreads to another community, to another community, and then eventually spreads throughout Uganda and then hopefully, you know, sort of throughout Africa. So that's sort of what I'm envisioning in the future. One of our co-inventors, uh, Adam, earned his bachelor's degree in life science from Penn State in 2010. He's currently a research associate at the Cognitive Neurophysiology Laboratory at the New York University School of Medicine, where he's doing research on epilepsy. He was recently accepted to the Department of Physiology at the University of Toronto, where he'll pursue a master's in neuroscience before attending medical school. Uh, Chu Zhang. <coughs> Could you please stand? Che. Please remain standing. Che is a Schreier Honor Scholar who will graduate tomorrow with a degree in biology. He has been accepted to graduate school at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom to earn a master's degree in public health. Then he plans to go to medical school. Please join me in thanking these two outstanding Penn Staters. The Daily Collegian reached a milestone this year, 125 years of publication. It has come a long way since its debut as the freelance and has been a steady source of award-winning reporting. Will all the Collegian staff members, past and present, please stand and wave so you can be recognized? All right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and congratulations for uh, generations of excellent work. Continuing with this spirit of recognition, this spring we, we named three new Evan Pugh professors. The title of Evan Pugh Professor is the highest honor that can be bestowed upon a faculty member of our university, and is given to faculty whose research, publications, teaching, and creative work are of the highest quality, who are acknowledged national and international leaders in their fields, who are involved in pioneering research or creative accomplishment, and who demonstrate consistently excellent teaching skills. This year's honorees are James Casting, Distinguished Professor of Geosciences, Janendra Jain, Irvin Mueller, Professor of Physics, and Bruce Logan, Cappy Professor of Environmental Engineering. Doctors Jane and Logan are out of town, but I am very pleased that Dr. Casting could be with us today. Jim, could you please join me at the podium? I'd also like to ask Provost Pangborn to join us as well. Jim joined the Penn State faculty in 1988. He specializes in the evolution of Earth's climate and atmosphere. He also researches habitable zones around other star systems, a field that is critical to the search for extraterrestrial life. In addition to being a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life, the American Geophysical Union, 
and the Geochemical Society. Congratulations, Jim. In addition to honoring Ken Fraser this spring, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences recognized Sharon Hamas Schiffer, a professor of chemistry and the Eberly Professor of Biochemistry, by naming her a fellow of the Academy. Dr. Hamas Schiffer is a world leader in theoretical chemistry whose research spans the fields of chemistry, physics, biology, and computer science. Her research has important implications for the development of alternative energy sources such as solar cells, as well as for protein engineering and drug design. Susan Brantley, Distinguished Professor of Geosciences and Director of the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute, was elected to the National Academy of Sciences as one of 84 new members and 21 foreign associates from 15 countries. Dr. Brantley is an inspiring teacher, researcher, and mentor, and her work focuses on the measurement and prediction of the rates of natural processes, in particular, the effect of microbial life on mineral reactivity. We were also pleased to learn that three professors from the College of Liberal Arts were awarded Guggenheim professors, uh, fellowships rather, for 2012. Lori Ginsberg, Professor of History and Women's Studies, Nina Jablonski, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, and David Rosenbaum, Distinguished Professor of Psychology. The three are among a diverse group of 181 artists, scientists, and scholars selected this year from nearly 3,000 applicants across the United States and Canada. Linda Patterson Miller, Professor of English at Penn State Abington, is just finishing her year as the Penn State Laureate. Linda's area of expertise is early 20th century American literature and art, and she has spent the year entertaining and enlightening our community with tales of writers and artists such as Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, and The Lost Generation. Linda, would you please stand so we can recognize you for your many contributions to Penn State. Christopher Staley, Distinguished Professor of Art, was named the 2012-13 Penn State Laureate. Over the next year, he plans to develop a series of talks and presentations on art and life where they intersect drawing from his 30 years of experience as a ceramic artist and educator. Chris is currently out of town, but you'll have a chance to meet him at another time. Penn State's outstanding faculty, coupled with a supportive research enterprise led by Hank Foley, has made for an impressive record of research awards. To date, funded research at Penn State is up 16.7% over last year, which translates into $634 million in new research awards. Agricultural sciences, engineering, health and human development, medicine and science have all seen robust funding, which is especially laudable given the flat federal spending in many of these areas. I'm happy to report that we're moving forward on several fronts related to abuse prevention efforts, and I want to take this opportunity to highlight some significant progress. This past Wednesday, we announced that Penn State has infused more than $1.1 million into the newly established Center for the Protection of Children based at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. This is more than twice the original startup fund's commitment as a result of higher than expected Big Ten Bowl revenues. The university also donated $1.5 million to the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. This is just the beginning. Our goal is to leverage the resources and experience available throughout Penn State to bring a new level of leadership in clinical care, research, education, and direction of policy-related activities to child abuse and neglect. I will continue to keep you informed of our work in the months ahead. Penn State is also continuing our work to enhance the educational opportunities in school environment for all children. One recent $3.5 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education is designed to help Penn State researchers improve the well-being of teachers so they can better support their students while reducing the stresses that lead to high teacher dropout rates. The study, led by Patricia Jennings and Mark Greenberg from Penn State's Prevention Research Center, 
will test a professional development program called CARE for teachers. Moving on to athletics and some very big wins for Penn State. Our wrestling team made us proud again when it captured its second straight Big Ten and NCAA championship titles and decisive victories. In addition to the team championship, there were three individual champions as well in the NCAA finals. Senior Frank Molinaro, sophomore David Taylor, and sophomore Ed Rood. As you may have guessed by the polite and muscle-bound group here today, several of the wrestlers have joined us. Unfortunately, coaches Cale Sanderson, Cody Sanderson, and Casey Cunningham couldn't be here because they're recruiting. Now I'd like those here to introduce themselves, but before I do, I want to note that these wrestlers here today are also academic stars. The average GPA of this group of students here today is 3.56, which is truly remarkable given their rigorous and time-consuming practice and game schedule. So now I'd like our wrestlers to please stand and tell us your name, your year, your major, and your hometown. Please. I'm Clay Stedman. Uh, I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm a finance major. I'm James English, North Pennsylvania. I'm born in Erie. Uh, Brian Pearsall, Libbit, Pennsylvania. I'm uh, rehab team coach. My name is Matt Brown. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm a freshman, and I'm studying crime law and justice. I'm James Fischella. I'm a freshman. I'm from Carmel, Indiana, and I'm undecided. My name is Nick Santos. I'm from Naperville, Illinois, and I'm a volunteer assistant coach. My name is Adam Blint. I'm from Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, and I'm the director of operations. Okay. Great. Well, please, thank you. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your coming today. And again, congratulations. Our Lady Lion head coach, Coquise Washington, is more than a presence on the court. She has built a strong bond with the community through outreach and inventive communications. I asked Coquise to join us so we can recognize her for an outstanding season. She led her team with integrity, heart, and Lady Lion spirit. Coquise was named Big Ten Coach of the Year and the 2012 Russell Athletic WBCA Region 6 Coach of the Year. So please join me. Coquise, where are you? Yes. Join me in recognizing you. Congratulations on those wonderful honors, Coquise. I also want to call your attention to a few athletes who may have slipped under your radar. For example, Penn State pitcher Stephen Hill turned heads when he became the first Penn Stater to throw a no-hitter since 1995. <laughs> Freshman sensation Robbie Kreese became just the third athlete in Penn State history to break the four-minute barrier in the mile run. And Nate Savoy became the first swimmer in the history of the program to be named Big Ten Freshman of the Year. He also earned his first collegiate All-American honors. Penn State's men's volleyball team finished a very exciting season last night. Unfortunately, it was a loss to top-seeded UC Irvine in the NCAA National Semifinals. Penn State was making its 14th straight appearance in the NCAA Semifinals and 28th overall. Uh, this is a young team, so we can look forward to more great seasons to come. And here's an achievement that has special significance to Penn State as we continue to strive for athletic and academic excellence. 63 Penn State student athletes representing seven sports earned winter academic all Big Ten honors. Penn State's 63 honorees bring the Nittany Lions all-time total to nearly 4,000 during the 18 years of the conference academic program. Congratulations go to our athletes, coaches, academic advisors, and support staff who meet the needs of our student athletes. Finally, I have a few items from development to share. As you can see by this photo of the groundbreaking for the Pagula Ice Arena, Hockey Valley is officially here. What you can't see is that we all had hat hair after we took off our helmets, <laughs> and Joe Batista nearly checked me with his shovel. 
Other than the need for a few penalty calls, it was a momentous occasion made even more special by the Pakulas, who increased their total support to $102 million for the arena and scholarships. Terry and Kim's unprecedented generosity to Penn State is inspiring and transformative, and we do look forward to the arena's opening in time for the 2013-14 season. The class of 2012 has also demonstrated their commitment to Penn State's future. This year, the class continued the senior class gift tradition with a commitment to create a Nittany Lion Shrine historical display. It will depict the shrine's history from the origins of the Nittany Lion as the university's mascot in 1907 to the statue's completion as the 1940 senior class gift and what was to become the enduring symbol of Penn State. The class of 2012's gift also will add improved lighting and ADA accessibility, making the shrine more visitor friendly all year round. In addition, because the campaign met Ed and Helen Hintz's challenge to obtain more than 3,000 pledges, Ed and Helen have generously offered to endow a $50,000 trustee scholarship in the name of the class. Thank you, Ed and Helen, for that generosity. One recent graduate who is already giving back is David Rosenko, the CEO and founder of Weebly, a tech startup based in San Francisco. David is a 2007 graduate of Penn State's College of Information Sciences and Technology and the youngest recipient of the Penn State Alumni Achievement Award. He returned to campus to share his experience with our students and to donate a $400,000 gift to create the David Rosenko Scholarship for Entrepreneurship, which will help ISD students to launch their own companies while they are still in school. We hope they graduate too, by the way. <laughs> Last Friday, I had the pleasure of participating in a wonderful evening to honor Susan Welch's 20 plus year tenure as Dean of the College of the Liberal Arts. Only a handful of academic deans have previously reached the 20 year mark and none of them have been a woman. Susan is a role model, a pioneer, and a visionary. To recognize Susan's unique contributions to Penn State, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends came together and raised more than $3 million in honor of her legacy. More than 80% of the commitments are targeted to graduate education, one of the Dean's top fundraising priorities in For the Future, the campaign for Penn State students. Finally, I promised in March that we would invite THON's 2012 overall chair, Elaine Tanella, to, to, to attend today's meeting. As you know, this year's THON set another record, $10.7 million for the Four Diamonds Fund at the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. I'm very pleased Elaine could attend this meeting along with the 2013 overall chair, Will Martin, and Barry Bram, who serves as the official university advisor to THON in addition to his other full-time duties. Will Elaine, Will, and Barry please stand? These three represent the past, the present, and the future of THON and the tens of thousands of hours that make THON the largest student philanthropy in the world. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you. That now con that concludes my report, and I'd be happy to take questions. Any questions? Oh, there's one. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just a quick question. I understand that there's been a change in legislation in Pennsylvania regarding identification that's used uh, when appearing to vote, and with re particular regard to uh, student IDs, there is a new requirement for an expiration date. Have we made accommodations to uh, meet that standard so our students are prepared? 
That's a very good question, Barry, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, David Gray, uh, who's right on top of that situation, to give us the most recent information. Yes, we are planning to make that accommodation. We will be doing so in a very low-cost and efficient manner by uh, providing stickers with the expiration date for current students, and uh, we will pr uh, provide an expiration date for new incoming students uh, imprinted right on the uh, ID card. Thank you, Rod, and that was a great report. When Keith and I took office in January, we pledged three core principles. These principles reflect the overarching purpose that I personally and the board in full aspire to exemplify. They are change, reform, and openness. Penn State is one of the best teaching and research universities in the world. Our job as trustees is to work with President Erickson to make sure that this is always so. It's a time of great challenge, but also of opportunity to reaffirm our fundamental excellence. Our students, our alumni, our faculty, and the entire state deserve nothing less. We've also identified the need to examine our governance structure to determine if we can and should make changes to improve board oversight of the university as well as access to university operations. We anticipate a short period of evaluation and subsequent change. We took the first steps in March when we expanded our committee structure. We now have five standing committees instead of three, and we have five new subcommittees. They've all been hard at work, and at this time, I'd like to proceed with the reports from our standing committees. I'd first like to call on Marianne Alexander for the report on the Committee on Academic Affairs and Student Life. Marianne. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is my job to say that I would note that a quorum of the committee is in attendance at this time, and I will not call the roll. Since we last met as a committee, We've had an opportunity to learn about an exciting array of possibilities for students to learn in a variety of settings during their college career. The first thing we did was hear from Dean Corner of the College of Arts and Architecture, who brought a fantastic team from her college to talk about a very exciting cross-campus interdisciplinary project that intersects, and I want you all to listen about these fields that are working together here architecture, landscape architecture, dance, and engineering. And maybe some of you saw some of the pictures in the paper or caught this on television, some of the very exciting outdoor spaces that were taken over by contraptions and, and motion by people, and they worked with a dance company uh, out on the West Coast as well. They got grant money to do this, and they reported to us as a requirement of their grant that they give a report to the Board of Trustees. So we were delighted to accept that report on your behalf and uh, got very excited about, um, well, we, I think we gained insight to how, onto how, into how students working with each other, faculty and other professionals across disciplines can learn an enormous amount about their own capabilities and how other fields can enrich their own course of studies. Thank you, Dean Corner, for including a student who was dynamite on your team who reported to us. And the report turned out to be a perfect segue or introduction to what the main business was for us that day, um, which was hearing from Patrick Terenzini, Dr. Patrick Terenzini, distinguished professor and senior scientist emeritus in higher education at Penn State. He speaks around the country and the world, and we were lucky to, that he was in town for our meeting, he spoke to us about his 30 years of reviewing research on how college affects students through their total college experience, where learning takes place in a variety of settings, not only the classroom, but internships, student organizations, and service learning, just to mention a few, and projects like the one Dean Corner presented to us. He made a strong case for the importance of a university supporting a variety of learning experiences for students some of which are not traditional. And he gave us a lot of food for thought um, that will inform our work in the next few years or longer. Um, we were happy to have him and hope that he'll come back. 
Now, we have also um, received information on the agenda regarding undergraduate programs, and I understand that there is a, de a consent agenda. Is that right? That will be flashed on the screen? No? Okay. It's just in, in your booklets. Okay. This is the first time I've done this before. I was chair of a committee that didn't get to do business like this with, <laughs> with the you know, screen and the computer. So bear with me. Thank you, Paula, for your coaching. <laughs> And number two, where you all have seen that you, you've seen the agenda regarding undergraduate programs. So I'm assuming you've all read it and are informed. I know the committee reviewed it, at least looked at it yesterday, and are on board. Number two, the recommendation for approval of administrative appointment. Additionally, information was included in the agenda regarding President Erickson's recommendation for the approval of his appointment of Charles Whiteman as the Elizabeth L. and John P. Surma, Jr., Dean of the, of the, where well, we have all the names here, of the Mary Jean and Frank Schmiel College of Business. I would like to call on President Erickson to speak to that appointment. Thank you, Marianne. It's now my pleasure to recommend for your approval the appointment of Charles H. Whiteman as the Elizabeth L. and John P. Surma, Jr., Dean of Penn State Smeal College of Business, effective July 1. Dr. Whiteman comes to us after a long tenure at the University of Iowa. For the last six years in the position of Senior Associate Dean for the Tippy College of Business. He has also been serving as Interim Director for the Institute for Economic Research at Iowa, and he has held the Leonard A. Hadley Chair in Leadership since 2008. In his position as Senior Associate Dean at the University of Iowa, Dr. Whiteman has been responsible for undergraduate and graduate degree programs, faculty and staff recruitment, promotion and tenure, budgetary operations, college facilities, technology operations, and strategic planning for the business school. He is a scholar, a highly respected teacher, and a proven leader. Dr. Whiteman has more than 32 years of experience in higher education and business. He's a leading economist who has advised the state of Iowa's Department of Management and the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and he has served on dozens of collegiate and university committees. Dr. Whiteman earned his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Kansas and a PhD in economics from a fine institution, the University of Minnesota. I believe Charles Whiteman is exceptionally qualified for this position, and I'm confident he will continue to move the Smeal College of Business forward and create an atmosphere that promotes the highest quality teaching, research, and service. I highly recommend his appointment. Thank you, President Erickson, for those remarks. We look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Whiteman in a few moments, and most of all, working with him for the future of Penn State. A resolution was included in the agenda, and I will entertain a motion from the Committee on Am Academic Affairs and Student Life for its adoption. Is there a second? second. It's been seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. The vote motion is carried. We're going to move on now to discontinuation of the educational division at Penn State Great Valley. I assume that Dr. Whiteman's coming up at a later time to yes, speak. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just, okay. We have received information regarding the phasing out of two part-time master's degrees currently extended from the College of Education at University Park to Penn State Great Valley. Once these changes are completed, Great Valley will be neither an academic home to any education programs nor a tenure home for any edu education faculty. Therefore, it is proposed to discontinue the education division at Penn State Great Valley. A resolution was included in the agenda, and I will entertain a motion from the Committee on Academic Affairs and Student Life for is it a its adoption. Is there a second? It's been seconded. Any discussion? Okay. Oh, excuse me. I'm blind. Thank you. <coughs> Marianne, uh, once we eliminate the education division at Great Valley, what remains? You know, I'm going to have to defer to, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, uh, the market for that uh, particular graduate degree 
has, has really uh, declined substantially over the years. In addition to that, uh, uh, we will continue to offer certain kinds of things such as uh, principalship and so forth, but we believe we can do everything we can uh, they're operating really out of our Harrisburg campus and the world campus. So we will not have a, a resident program in, there in place. So we're closing down a physical facility right Well, it's part of the same building, so we're not closing down a physical facility, uh, but we're, uh, we're uh, eliminating that as a degree program there. Any other questions? Yes, Cynthia. Stephanie. That's okay. Um, with regard to f phasing it out, um, are there any current students and what is the plan uh, with regard to their completion of their degrees? Anytime, anytime we phase out a program, Stephanie, we have to make accommodations for students to complete degrees that they have already started, either through some combination of uh, existing courses, world campus, or uh, uh, offering at another site such as Harrisburg. Any other questions? Hearing any more discussion, if not, we will uh, vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed? Hearing none, it's, the motion is carried. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item very quickly. And it has to do with the elimination of the Department of Integrative Arts in the College of Arts and Architecture. We've received information regarding this elimination, and it was founded in 1990. The department served as the administrative home for faculty and programs in graphic design and integrative arts, and offered an interdisciplinary option for degree completion. Integrative arts also provided the vast majority of general education enrollments for the college. Due to changes in faculty lines and assignments, it is proposed to eliminate the department. None of these programs or degrees offered by the unit, unit have been or will be eliminated. No full-time faculty lines are being eliminated in the reorganization. All faculty members will be assigned to their original units or to those where their disciplinary backgrounds and tasks are more closely aligned. A resolution was included in the agenda and I will entertain a motion from the Committee on Academic Affairs and Student Life for its adoption. Is there a second? Thank you. Is there any discussion or questions? Seeing none, we will move on. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you, the motion is carried. There being no other items to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Uh, Madam Chair, the committee recommends the adoption of the resolutions projected on the screens. This is where the screen comes in, thank you. <laughs> I feel so glad. That's great, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Marianne. And as a reminder, the full board is in session. Uh, from the full board, may I have a motion for approval for what's on the screen? Move it. Okay, second? Second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Okay, any opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, so before we continue, this is the opportunity to introduce Chuck Whiteman, our newly appointed dean of the Smeal College of Business. Chuck, we're delighted to have you here. Would you care to comment on the committee on, uh, that you represent? I think maybe we have, yeah, here we go. Would you like to make any comment? I just wanted to say I'm delighted to be coming to Penn State. This is a terrific opportunity to be part of something that's excellent. Uh, I uh, have been a big tenor all my life with the exception of those three years at the University of Kansas uh, and one at Duke, if you can believe that. Uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I think I've been in the crucible and preparing for this kind of a position uh, since I became senior associate dean at the University of Iowa. There are a lot of similarities between the universities. This one's a lot better, uh, but the way that we do things uh, is, uh, is familiar to me. So I'm familiar with the way that we do budgeting, uh, the way resources are allocated, and so on. Uh, I'm uh, delighted uh, to be taking over from uh, Jim Thomas uh, in the College of Business, the Smeal College of Business. He's done a great job in delivering to me a very healthy baby. Uh, and it is a source of pride, I know, for the university. 
Uh, I'm very proud uh, to be part of this great operation, and I'm looking forward to helping take it to uh, the, next, uh, the next level. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I've had a great week uh, getting uh, acquainted with uh, people uh, here on the faculty, uh, and the staff, and so on. I've been using this as a, an opportunity to get up to speed very quickly. Uh, it's been wonderfully productive, I believe, and I'm looking forward to more. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'd like to call on Ira, Ira Lubert, who's the Vice Chair of the Committee on Audit risk, legal, and compliance. I'd like to call on him and his colleagues for a report of the committee and its subcommittees. Ira. Thank you, Karen. I would like to note that a quorum of the committee is in attendance at this time, and I will not call roll. The committee has reviewed and explored its charges since its formation in March. We have two official subcommittees, the subcommittee on legal and the subcommittee on audit. We also have a reporting line for the Special Investigations Task Force. The Subcommittee on Legal is responsible for reviewing matters pertaining to compliance, oversight, and legal issues as legally or otherwise prescribed, but not limited just to litigation strategies and other matters. I serve as chair of that committee, that subcommittee. The Legal Subcommittee has been receiving regular updates from the university's legal team with respect to the civil lit litigation filed against the university relating to the actions of Jerry Sandusky, the related insurance coverage litigation, the ongoing criminal cases involving Mr. Sandusky, Gary Schultz, and Tim Curley, and the ongoing state and federal investigations and other related legal matters. The following is a brief summary of all three. First, civil litigation. Two cases have been filed against the university by John Doe A. and C. Miller. Neither plaintiff is a victim identified in the grand jury presentment. Both cases have been filed in Philadelphia. The allegations against the university include negligence, negligence supervision, premises liability, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and conspiracy to endanger children. Ten additional victims are identified in the grand jury presentments, and one other has contacted the university, so we expect additional cases to be filed. At the university's request, the two cases have been stayed pending the criminal proceedings. The second area for the subcommittee, insurance coverage litigation. Penn State has purchased comprehensive and commercial general liability insurance policies from the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association insurance companies dating back from the 1950s to the present. PMA's policies covering, among other things, liability for bodily injury claims and attorney fees incurred in defending Penn State against such claims. Penn State tendered the John Doe A claim to PMA in January of 2012. PMA has reserved its rights to deny coverage, but provisionally agreed to provide a defense under PMA's 1991 and 1992 CGL policy. On the very same day, PMA filed suit against Penn State in federal county court in, in common pleas. In the Philadelphia County action, PMA seeks a, judici a ju judicial declaration that only one of PMA's policies applies to John Doe A, either its 91 or 92 or 92 or 93 policy, and that two, if PMA's 92 or 93 policy applies, PMA has no duty to defend or indemnify Penn State in Doe A lawsuit because of its claims that an abuse of molestation exclusion number 157 in that policy applies to exclude coverage. Penn State disputes both of PMA's positions as set forth in its lawsuit. So on February 15, 2012, Penn State filed suit against PMA in Center County Court of Common Pleas, asserting claims for breach of contract and bad faith claims handling. In the Center County action, Penn State asserts that all of PMA's policies in effect during the entire time period that John Doe A alleges that he suffered injury due to Sandusky's alleged misconduct apply. It has legal right to select the insurance policy year that will apply because DOE complaint alleges continuing bodily injury over many years. And three, only the 92-93 PM policy applies. Penn State's claim for coverage is not excluded by that policy abuse or molestation exclusion we disagree with. 
litigation regarding the full extent of PMA's obligations under the policies issued to Penn State remains ongoing. The third area that we're involved in is state and federal investigations. The State Attorney General and the United States Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Pennsylvania are continuing their investigations into matters relating to the prosecutions of, of Mr. Sandusky, Mr. Schultz, and Mr. Curley. The university, through its counsel, is fully cooperating with those investigations. Both inquiries are being conducted through the use of investigated grand juries, and for that reason, the confidentiality of those proceedings must be maintained. Criminal cases. The university continues to monitor the criminal actions against Mr. Sandusky, Mr. Schultz, and Mr. Curley, which are also ongoing. At this time, I'd like to call on John Surma, the chair of the Internal Audit Committee, to give his report. Thank you, Chair Lubert. I'll make my remarks just from my place here, and you can hold your position if that's uh, okay. Uh, my comments will be brief. Uh, yesterday, the subcommittee on audit held our regularly scheduled uh, meeting. In addition to the subcommittee members, we had uh, normal attendees, the senior vice president of finance and business, the controller, the internal audit director, representatives from Deloitte, our independent accountants, and uh, the board chair and the university president also joined us for much of the meeting. After we approved our minutes, we performed uh, an annual review of our subcommittee's operating guidelines, our charter, if you will, and updated them to reflect a number of operational enhancements and then the recent board committee restructuring that was already referred to. Uh, that review of our charter was done by reference to, among other things, uh, guide, guidelines presented by the Association of Governing Boards, AGB, we refer to quite a bit, the uh, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants information, uh, a number of other Big Ten audit committee charters, and audit committee charters from a number of commercial enterprises, so quite comprehensive. Uh, as part of the process, uh, we spent a bit of time yesterday uh, talking about responsibility for oversight of enterprise risk management and also for university compliance. We reached no final conclusion uh, as to which board committees or subcommittees would take on such oversight responsibility, although we did direct uh, the administration to provide an updated comprehensive list of compliance requirements applicable to uh, our university and uh, the significant risks which we uh, uh, assess from time to time. And then once we have all that together and we arrive at the final organizational structure from an administrative standpoint, we'll then uh, ensure that proper oversight is attended to from whatever committee would be appropriate. Uh, secondly, we received and reviewed with uh, management a number of regular reports for the fiscal year ended June 30, to, uh, 2011. First, the uh, Office of Management and Budget A133 Compliance Report. Uh, it's an audit report on expenditures under federal grants and contracts. That was performed by Deloitte, our independent auditors, and it was noted that there were no significant findings. Uh, second, the uh, report, the right to know information uh, that typically is filed with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania around this time of year, generally following the form of 990, even though it's a state requirement. Uh, we reviewed that, and that'll be filed sometime uh, later in the month. And then the IRS Form 990-T, an, an income tax form required to be filed for taxes on unrelated business income. We have some of that, and that report was also reviewed. We reviewed and accepted those with some modifications and suggested revisions. Uh, subcommittee also received status reports on audits and some other work performed by external auditors of Penn State subsidiaries and other operations. The subcommittee was updated on the status of certain findings with respect to an agreed-upon procedures audit performed at the Knowledge Park complex located at the Barron campus. The uh, findings indicated that the external management company operating the park was not in compliance with a number of operating agreements, and the administration was encouraged to work with the Barron campus leadership to make sure they addressed such findings as quickly as possible. Uh, my sense is they'll do that. Uh, third, we reviewed the audit plan uh, for the university's audit with our independent uh, audit firm Deloitte for the upcoming uh, audit year, June 30, 2012, consolidated financial statements. Uh, Deloitte, among other things, reviewed the areas they viewed as the most significant financial statement audit risks in their opinion. The subcommittee was satisfied with the audit plan and that was accepted. We reviewed the results of a number of operational, financial, and information technology audits that were completed by our internal audit staff uh, since our last meeting. It was noted that uh, management has presented appropriate corrective action responses to all the issues that were raised. Also, we reviewed with internal audit the status of issues identified in prior reports to ensure that appropriate attention is being made there. And it was noted that management's making appropriate progress in addressing those issues. 
we also uh, were provided some information to ongoing internal audit investigations into certain alleged questionable financial procedures or practices, and we'll follow those to their conclusion and receive a complete report on those at a later date. Uh, then we looked at the subcommittee self-assessment, uh, how we thought we were doing against our charter, uh, and that'll be communicated in the normal process through the full committee and back to the governance committee. Results overall were favorable compared well with prior years. Some concern expressed that because our agenda was getting longer that we might not have enough time to complete our responsibilities. I assured the subcommittee that I would take it upon myself that we had sufficient time to complete the agenda with plenty of time for discussion. Uh, reported that I had listened in on the Hershey Medical Center uh, audit committee meeting that was held uh, earlier in the week. Uh, that's part of our normal coordination process. And we return that courtesy uh, where their audit committee chair sits in on one of our meetings that'll happen later in the year. And then uh, finally, we had executive sessions, that is to say just the subcommittee members uh, with the appropriate parties, executive sessions with uh, Deloitte, with the internal audit director, and with members of administration. Uh, the purpose of that, by the way, is to assure those individuals of their ability to contact the audit subcommittee on audit members, including me, at any time if they feel it's necessary, and to further uh, encourage them to consider it their responsibility to do so. That completes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. At this time, I'd like to call upon Ken Fraser, who is the chair of the Special Investigations Tax Force. He has a report on the activities of the group. Thank you, Chair Lubert, and good afternoon, everyone. As the university community and the public at large is quite aware, the Special Investigations Task Force of the Board of Trustees has retained Judge Louis Free, a former FBI director and federal judge, and his firm to conduct an independent external investigation into how the alleged acts noted in the grand jury report that came to light this past November could have occurred at Penn State, where the breakdowns occurred, who knew what when, and what changes we can make to prevent such occurrences and their associated anguish from occurring in the future. Their goal, which is fully supported by the Special Investigations Task Force and the Board of Trustees, is to perform these tasks in a manner that is independent, comprehensive, and thorough. Judge Free and his team continue to investigate this matter fully, fairly, and completely, and they assure us that they've been able to do that. They are well into their investigation, fully engaged in reviewing voluminous documents and electronic data, conducting numerous interviews, and pursuing leads. By way of example, to date, the team has conducted over 400 interviews of various individuals including current and former university employees from myriad departments across the university, including academic, administrative, athletic departments, as well as current and past trustees and <coughs> others in the community. This investigation continues to be conducted in parallel with, but independent of, several other active investigations by agencies and governmental authorities, and will not interfere with any such official investigations. Judge Free and his team have cooperated and interfaced with those agencies and authorities throughout the course of the investigation. Judge Free's team also has been cooperating and interfacing with the NCAA and the Big Ten Conference in connection with their respective reviews of this matter. Additionally, as I previously have reported, besides working to uncover what occurred in the past, Judge Free and his team are thoroughly studying, reviewing, and testing all of the university's policies, procedures, compliance, and internal controls relating to the identifying and reporting of such sex crimes and misconduct. This examination includes, among other things, any failures or gaps in a university's control environment, compliance programs, and culture, which may have enabled the alleged misconduct to occur to go undetected and not be reported and addressed promptly and properly. During the January Board of Trustees meeting, I announced that Judge Free had made some initial recommendations for improving organizational structures and protocols from the board and that the board would review these. During the March meeting, 
President Erickson reported on the efforts that the university has already taken up, up to this time, or up to that time, I should say, towards implementing the interim recommendations, which fall into five categories. Those are, as a reminder, strengthening policies for programs involving minors, prompt reporting of incidents of abuse and sexual misconduct, compliance with the Clery Act's training and reporting requirements, administrative reforms, and athletic department security arrangements. Since the March meeting, the university has taken additional steps towards implementing those interim recommendations, including hiring a Clery Act compliance coordinator to work collaboratively with various offices at the university to develop, implement, and oversee programs that ensure the institution's overall compliance with the Clery Act and associated regulations at all campuses, as well as to work with various university offices to ensure compliance with the provisions of the Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights and Drug-Free Schools and Safe Campuses Regulations, and then finally, enacting a significant revision to the Administrative Policy 39, which relates to overseeing the supervision and treatment of minors involved in university-sponsored programs or events housed or held at any Penn State campus. The Special Investigative Task Force expects that Judge Free will, will issue additional recommendations before the middle of June. It remains the Board's intention that at the conclusion of Judge Free's fully independent work process, the full findings and recommendations will be made public. As I outlined for you in January, those findings will address failures that occurred in the reporting process, the cause for those failures, who had knowledge of allegations of sexual abuse, and how those allegations were handled by the trustees, Penn State administrators, and other staff. As I've stated earlier, we understand that answers cannot come soon enough for all concern, and I assure you, Judge Free and his team are moving as quickly as possible. However, Judge Free's primary emphasis, and he reminds us of, of this every time we interact with him, is on doing the best possible job. Our hope continues to be that the investigation will be completed by the beginning of the next academic year. In closing, let me say on behalf of the Board of Trustees that the victims continue to be at the forefront of our thoughts each and every day, and as I've said previously, we sincerely hope that our work can contribute to breaking the silence surrounding sexual violence that appears to have allowed evil to prevail in far too many instances in our society. Thank you very much for your generous listening. Thank you, Ken. At this time, are there any questions for any chair of any of the subcommittees? Seeing none, uh, uh, no other items before the committee, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ira, John, and Ken. So now I'd like to call on Linda Strump for a report from the Committee on Finance and Fiscal Plant. <laughs> Thank you. That was our old name. We're Finance, Business, and Capital Planning. Thank you. It's taken me six months to figure that one out. Um, I'd like to note that a quorum of the committee is in attendance. Since our last meeting, the committee discussed fiscal year 2013 budget scenarios. And just to remind the board, uh, we'll be asked to vote on the fiscal 2013 budget at our July meeting. Um, there are several items for information or action by the committee at this time. And let, remind, let me remind you, this is a sort of strange scenario here, but the voting at this point is just the committee members. You will have a chance to vote on everything a little bit later in the meeting. So at this point, when I ask for votes, it's just the uh, members of the committee. Uh, but feel free to ask questions. Everybody's free to ask questions, so I don't want to prevent you from asking questions. Agenda item one is in with, with regard to the consent agenda, which is shown in your appendix Roman numeral two. Uh, may I please have a motion by somebody on the committee to approve action items G, H, and I in the consent agenda? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item two is a proposal to adopt an interim maintenance and operating budget for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2012. A final budget will be submitted for approval at the July 12th Board of Trustees meeting. Any questions on the interim budget? Mark. Yes, I have a question. Uh, you're talking about the budget under C2? Yeah, 
Correct. Uh, under the general funds uh, total, is that inclusive of tuition? I'm assuming yes, but yes? Yes. And at what level tuition? Is that prior years, this, this year? So it's current year, current so there's year. no increase. That's a current year tuition. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, can I please have a motion to approve agenda item two? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Agenda item three proposes to name the new Career Services Center at Penn State Wilkes Bar, the Struthers Family Career Services Center at Penn State Wilkes Bar. Uh, may I have a motion to approve agenda item three? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Agenda item four is a proposal for appointment of architect for the renovation of Burroughs Building at University Park. I'd like to call on uh, David Gray to present this item. David. Thank you, Linda. Burroughs Building is located on Petit Mall in the historic core of campus between Curtin and Pollock Roads. It primarily houses programs for the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts and is in need of modernization of its building systems. The original 50,000 square foot building was built in 1940 with north and south additions added in the 1960s. Burroughs Building was originally designed by Charles Clowder the architect who designed many of the early, most memorable buildings in Penn State's core campus. Burroughs Building has been well maintained and appears sound, but mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are outdated or non-existent. Since the electrical system has reached its maximum capacity, only a limited number of inefficient air conditioning units can be used, and a comfortable working environment cannot be maintained in the summer. Due to an antiquated heating system, winter months are also uncomfortable. The building still contains most of the original single pane windows, which are very inefficient. Many units cannot be closed. Room configurations in the 1960s north and south additions no longer meet the needs of the building occupants, and accessibility issues need to be addressed. The goal is to renovate Burroughs Building and yet preserve the architectural integrity of the structure. The design team will replace windows and exterior doors and implement interior architectural reconfigurations particularly in the 1960s additions, that will increase the number of offices. Accessibility will also be improved. The building systems will be replaced, and utility infrastructure to the building will be upgraded, including connecting the building to the campus chilled water system and providing additional electrical capacity. In keeping with our commitment to environmental sustainability, we expect this facility will attain LEED certification. The design team must have a proven portfolio and expertise in the phased renovations of historical buildings such as Burroughs. Based on these considerations, we recommend the appointment of BLT Architects of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The initial assignments for the Burroughs Building Architectural Team will be to design the renovations to a schematic level, develop a phasing scheme for the whole project, and prepare cost estimates for each phase. Detailed designs will be developed for project phases as funding for design and construction of each phase is identified. The following slides show examples of the firm's previous work. The first example is Borland Building Renovation here at University Park. This is an interior shot of the Technion Building in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And this is the Straw Bridge and Clothier Building in Philadelphia. The Subcommittee on Architect Engineer Selection rec recommends the appointment of BLT Architects of Philadelphia, PA, as architect for the design of Burroughs Building renovations at University Park. Thank you. Um, with regard to the um, previous projects that they did that you just showed us, I'm just curious um, what type of experience they have with taking the older buildings and also um, doing the renovations in a manner which makes them LEED um, certified. Do they have experience in that area? Ford, do you happen to know what their experience is with older buildings such as this? So, there's something on, there's a screen, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, one more. Um, Ford, when we worked with them previously, did they come um, in budget? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, will the Committee on Finance and Physical Plan, I did the same thing you did, you Finance, Business and Capital Planning, recommend adoption of the resolution regarding item four as shown on the screen. Goodness. Must be one of the losers. Um, Okay, all in favor, aye, opposed. And again, you will have, this is just appointment of the architect because I, I was amazed nobody asked the question of how much is this going to cost. 
Okay. So you will you will be every step of the way informed or and asked for approval of the dollar amounts. But it's very hard when you're doing these renovations because we discussed this in committee yesterday. Uh, those of you that, that were there. Um, so as we have a cost estimate, we will we'll bring, it bring it back to you. Okay. Agenda item five is a proposal for final plans and authorization to award contracts for the renovation of main building at Penn State Brandywine. And call on David. Thanks again, Linda. The main building at Penn State Brandywine, built in 1970, houses administrative offices, student services, classrooms, and labs. About a third of the building was successfully renovated in 2010. Now the university intends to renovate the remainder of the building. The 19,000 square feet that were previously renovated include mostly offices and a lecture hall. This phase of the project includes upgrades to building infrastructure, program changes, improved energy efficiency, and enhancements to approximately 30,000 square feet of the rest of the building. The existing main building facilities are inadequate and they are outdated for today's laboratory and science classroom requirements. Therefore, we would like to reconfigure the building to increase lab space. Penn State Brandywine Strategic Planning has identified a potential for tremendous growth in its science-focused curricula. The campus has determined that its academic programming must shift to accommodate that trend. The building's mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are over 40 years old and obviously inadequate. For instance, inefficient uh, window air conditioning units are used to cool spaces, and electrical service to the building is inadequate to serve the entire building. This is the existing layout of the first floor. In the proposed plan, the bookstore will move to the Commons and Athletic Center, and similar functions will be clustered together in a more logical layout. Admissions and continuing education, student services, advising, career, and other services, a new professional classroom, an open student lounge, and mail services are located on the first floor. The existing lecture hall received renovated finishes two years ago and so will only receive upgrades in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems as part of this renovation. The use of glass <coughs> encourages views into the student services spaces to promote a welcoming environment to existing uh, and prospective students. The existing computer lab with offices on the second floor will be converted to a classroom and the finishes in all classrooms will be updated. The second floor machine room will receive updated and energy efficient building system equipment. New boilers in the basement and new central air conditioning equipment on the roof complete the upgrade to the building's aging infrastructure. The existing layout of the third floor has only three science labs. With the new configuration, the overall student lab space will more than double. The plans call for physics, biology, and chemistry labs with all associated uh, support spaces as well as a classroom. Visibility into the labs will be improved with glazed walls. SMP architects have prepared a rendering of the renovated building as seen from Yearsley Mill Road to the south, but I think our, oh, there we go. This is the main building today. This is a rendering with the existing brick and concrete cleaned and repaired and all windows replaced with new aluminum with double glazed solar control insulated window units. The mechanical equipment on the roof of the building will be screened with a material that is similar in color and texture to the trim panels on the facade of the building. The total project budget is nine and a half million and completion is expected before the students return in the fall of 2013. We recommend approval of the final plans and authorization to award contracts for the main building renovation at Penn State Brandywine. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Governor. We just talked about Great Valley. Now we're talking about Brandywine. 15 miles apart, approximately? Pardon me? A little more. A little more. I'm just curious as to why we have two branch campuses that close to each other. Remember, the uh, Great Valley campus has always been a graduate center. There have been no undergraduate programs there. Uh, Brandywine, in contrast, has had no graduate programs. But uh, as, we, uh, as we evolve uh, mission for both of these places, uh, we will be offering more graduate programming at Brandywine as well as using the facility more fully at, uh, at Great Valley to offer experiences during the year <coughs> for undergraduates. But that's the idea, really, is to utilize the facilities more completely. Okay. Thank you, David. May I have a motion to approve agenda item five? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Agenda item six is a proposal for approval of the Liberty Lutheran Housing Development Corporation 
ground lease agreement. David. Thank you. The village at Penn State is located north of the Mount Nittany Expressway and west of Fox Hollow Road. In July 1997, the Board of Trustees approved the lease or sale of portions of land associated with the development of a continuous care retirement community. The site of the CCRC, now known as the village at Penn State, was identified as a combination of approximately 80 acres of private land at Toft Trees and approximately 80 acres of land owned by the university. The lease option of uh, sale agreement term sheet provided that the lease property will be up to 50 acres of the 80 acre university owned parcel and the CCRC would be constructed on this land and occupy up to 50 acres uh, dependent upon the final size of the project. It was anticipated that over time the entire site would be used by the village at Penn State and options were reserved for the purpose of leasing or selling to the CCRC developers the remaining portion of the 80 acre tract. The officers of the university were authorized to enter into the lease option of sale agreement with the village at Penn State Retirement Community, VPSRC, or an IRS 501c3 tax exempt entity to which VPSRC assigns its rights to enter into the lease for the purpose of obtaining financing. The length of the term was 35 years commencing at the closing of the financing to construct the initial phase of the CCRC. Two 15 year renewal options were reserved to run consecutively conditioned upon the VPSRC not being in default at the time of the exercise of this option. The options to lease or sale additional portions of the remaining 30 acres were reserved for a period of 10 years from the effective date of the initial lease agreement. Until such time as the VPSRC exercised these options, with the provision that such options were contingent on the successful operation of the retirement community and no defaults under the existing lease, the property was available to the university for its use and benefit. On February 1, 2002, the university entered into a ground lease containing 50.515 acres with the village at Penn State Retirement Community, consistent with the Board of Trustee July 97 approval and related term sheet as referenced above. The performance factors associated with the options to lease or sale additional portions of the property were not met. The options were not exercised and have since expired. On November 30, 2011, VPSRC filed for reorganization under Chapter 11 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, and on February 3rd, 2012, the court approved the sale of substantially all the assets of VPSRC to Liberty Lutheran Housing Development Corporation, a Pennsylvania nonprofit corporation. <coughs> because of the ground lease dated February 1, 2002 is one of these assets, it is now being proposed that the ground lease be assigned to LLHDC. Further, Liberty Lutheran has requested that the initial term of the ground lease be extended to expire on May 31st, 2042, resulting in a full 30-year initial term for the amended ground lease. Also, it is proposed that the lease payments begin with the fifth anniversary date of the amended lease. No other amendments are being proposed to the February 1, 2002 ground lease. A term sheet reflecting the amended ground lease is included in Appendix 4. We recommend that the existing ground lease with the village at Penn State Retirement Community be assigned to Liberty Lutheran Housing Development Corporation. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. As I understand it, there's no Penn State money going into this deal, but the marketing arrangement that we've had in the past with uh, the village continues with Lutheran. In that, other words, they'll continue to be able to use our name and the marketing power of our alumni association to solicit uh, 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 occupants. Both of those are, are consistent yeah. with my understanding. And, yes. and that we have not we have not earned a penny in uh, lease money since this deal was first worked out because nobody's ever paid us for any any lease, right? I don't believe I don't believe we re we've received funds because they're in default. Yeah, but I mean, even okay, prior even but prior to that, even prior to that, we had a lease that had obligations that they never met. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and now and now we don't have to. We're not going to get any more money for five years from the amended lease. When, when would that be? That would be five. five, years five is that five years from now? Five years from now. <clears throat> so we can't, we, we've never got any money from this lease and we can't expect to get any for five more years. Is that, that right? is That is correct. Thank you. John. John. Uh, just sort of continuing with that same general line of thought, David, have you taken a look at the financial stability, wherewithal, ratings, et cetera, of the group that we're going to be 
now leasing two, do we expect them to be sufficiently uh, liquid to pay this in five years? Yes, we believe that, that this is a stable organization with the ability to repay. Joel? Just ask a, a question. What happens if we don't do it? Uh, whoa. <laughs> I don't think we have much of a choice on this one. I mean, I don't know what our options are, so it's... Uh, we, don't, we don't believe there are uh, any other viable options, uh, which is why we're, we're bringing this forward at this time. Ira? Yeah, just to put in five years, is the rate of the lease payment the same as it was initially, or is it, or for the extension, have they agreed to pay any more rent for the granting of the extension that we're going to give them? The lease, uh, the lease payments would be, you know, base lease payment fifty thousand dollars per year, and then there's uh, there are stipulations for additional lease payments uh, depending upon the capacity that's uh, that's achieved at the uh, at the site. But the, I, from memory, the fifty thousand is less than the original lease payments when we I thought we uh, we had a seven percent royalty. If memory serves me on sales and uh, a base rate that was higher than that when we first signed this lease back in the late nineties. Well, the amounts, uh, the amounts owed to the university in 2002, for instance, were $20,000, then uh, escalating to $50,000 in FY03, and then, you know, upwards from there. Ted. Uh, yes, in reviewing the term sheet, uh, Dave, uh, I was a little bit concerned. I know it's a 501c3. But uh, with the environment that's there today with municipalities asking tax-exempt organization for payments in lieu of taxes, uh, I would suggest that we consider some language in the term sheet that identifies the fact that if there is a pilot request, that it becomes an obligation of the lessee. That's a good suggestion. We can certainly take that under advisement, Ted. Thank you. I don't want to be repetitive, but what does happen if we don't agree to that. I think this is this is the one way we can we have some pro, uh, pro, uh, prospect reasonable prospect of getting some uh, revenue out of this particular arrangement. The um, the you know former uh, owner uh, the former lessee has has gone uh, into bankruptcy, so there's no prospect of getting any uh, of any capital out of that particular entity. Can they operate the facility if they don't have access to, uh, do, do we have any more negotiating power? Uh, uh, it seems to me if we own the, the land, uh, what they have isn't worth anything unless we agree to this. <laughs> that's... I think that's I, I think that's fair. Uh, obviously, there's uh, there's an asset there. There there are people living there, um, and uh, clearly, I think there's there is some uh, leverage that we have in that uh, in that proposition. But we think our best uh, you know our best um, path forward is to uh, is to align ourselves with a financially viable entity, which we believe Liberty Lutheran to be. Steve, Steve. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that, Joe, it would collapse. It would not exist if, if we don't go ahead with this. I think there's been a lot of deliberate and time spent on trying to figure out what to do because they're in and now have gone into bankruptcy. And uh, this is a viable entity that's taking it over. And, of course, not to say, and not, I mean, there are a lot of Penn State faculty members, ex-faculty members, and people from the community living there. Uh, I think it it would end and then it would collapse, and I don't think we want to be party to that. I think this is a reasonable solution. Linda, if I could. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, I, I don't know anything about the specifics of this aspect, but the, the bankruptcy court proceeding that this is under uh, is not a normal commercial relationship process under the bankruptcy proceedings, as I understand it, and there may be experts here, I'm not one. Uh, it, I think the, the court can insist on certain outcomes uh, or be coming close to insisting on it. So I, I don't know that we would have the normal negotiating opportunities you would think of in a normal commercial situation. So I'll just, I have no idea what the specifics are here. Someone else could have fine on that, but I think that's possible. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure that it was looked at no, you know, I think from every all, angle. So. These are all good questions. Okay. 
So thank you, David. Are there any questions? All the committee on, will the Committee on Finance and Business and Capital Planning recommend adoption of the resolutions at, uh, item six shown on the agenda? There. Is it coming? Is it coming on the screen? Is it? No, that's the wrong thing. Can you back up? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's in your, it, it is in your materials. It is not on the screen. All in favor? Aye. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Motion. Yeah, move a motion. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The next agenda item is the proposed sale of Whitehall Road property at University Park. And again, ask David Gray to present the item. Thank you. At the board's July 1999 meeting, it approved the acquisition of approximately 1,100 acres of land at various locations throughout Center County from the Mellon Family Trust and the Richard King Mellon Foundation. The purchase from the Richard King Mellon Foundation and gift from the Mellon Family Trust resulted in the university acquiring six tracts of land comprised of 16 separately deeded parcels. One of these tracts, located along and between West Whitehall Road and Route 45, included six separately deeded parcels which con contained nearly 565 acres. This aerial shows a portion of the entire tract which is outlined in yellow. The total piece extends further to the left and bottom. This tract of land is about five miles from the core campus to the south of Whitehall Road. Blue Course Drive is visible extending to the Penn State golf courses. Route 45 cuts through the tract on the south. Since 1999, a subdivision plan entitled Penn State University Whitehall Road 6 Lot Final Subdivision Plan was developed to accommodate the sale of a number of parcels. At its March 2008 meeting, the Board of Trustees approved the sale of a 75-acre parcel to Center Region Cog in Ferguson Township, as well as a 59-acre parcel to the State College Borough Water Authority. At its March 2011 meeting, the Board of Trustees approved the sale of a 25-acre parcel to Ferguson Township. The most recent transaction occurred in August 2011 when the university sold a .254 acre parcel to an adjacent church. Two adjoining parcels identified in the subdivision plan were rezoned to multifamily residential R4 in Ferguson Township and engineering studies were completed to establish initial, initial site infrastructure plans consistent with zoning and with Ferguson Township requirements. A right of way for access is included in the subdivision. In August 2011, the university listed these two parcels for sale. One parcel, lot three in the subdivision plan, consists of 25.13 undeveloped acres, and the second parcel, lot four of the subdivision plan, consists of 15.26 acres of undeveloped land. This aerial shows residential development, including student housing, adjacent to the parcels, which are located within the growth boundary for Ferguson Township. The site has ready access to all utilities, emergency services, and CATA bus service. A PennDOT project is currently underway to widen Whitehall Road and install a signalized intersection at Whitehall Road and Blue Course Drive. An appraisal last year valued the property at $11.25 million. Toll Brothers Incorporated has offered the university $13.5 million for these parcels, and the university has entered into an agreement of sale, which is contingent upon approval of the university's Board of Trustees with closing to occur after Toll Brothers receives all necessary municipal approvals. Toll Brothers Incorporated will be acquiring this property through a wholly owned subsidiary named Springton Point, a Pennsylvania limited partnership. Toll Brothers' intent is to develop a student housing project. We recommend the approval of the sale of these two parcels. Thank you. Question. David. David, if I understand you correctly, this was put out for open bidding, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it was, uh, I believe, 67 different uh, potential buyers were, were uh, solicited, and three actually entered bids. Uh, is there a drop-dead date by which Toll Brothers has to get all of their final approvals? Dan, what's the uh, drop-dead date? Yeah. I just wanted to uh, uh, say that we discussed this in depth at the committee meeting yesterday, and there were a lot of questions, I think, leading up to it, and uh, all of which is it part of the master plan of the university? Did we have an appraisal? Did we put it out to bid? And uh, I think the, the staff had, uh, to my, in my opinion, satisfactory answers to all of them, and, and uh, I was not inclined prior to those, that session, but uh, I think you've done your due diligence. 
Any other questions, comments? Great. It should be noted that the resolution has been changed from what's in your book, as David just said. So the resolution reflects the approval of sale to Springton Point LP rather than the Toll Brothers. Uh, are there any questions? May I have a motion to approve agenda item seven? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Great. Agenda item eight is an update on the status of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania appropriation request. And I'll call on President Erickson. The uh, next several weeks uh, will be a busy time in Harrisburg as uh, the General Assembly begins to uh, take up uh, budget proposals. Uh, uh, we're uh, currently working with uh, quite a number of different scenarios uh, based on the possible range of uh, outcomes of those deliberations. Uh, I will continue uh, to do my best to make the case for uh, Penn State funding in the current environment. And um, as I say, this should be a, uh, a very uh, uh, busy, active uh, next uh, six weeks or so. Governor. Let me just add, I, I agree with the uh, President, it will be busy. Um, <clears throat> and as, sitting here as Governor, I sit here representative of the, the uh, uh, citizens and taxpayers of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And it is a very difficult economic time that we're still in. Uh, I will say uh, President Erickson has worked very well with us in presenting his uh, issues. And uh, I want to compliment him on that. It was a much different approach than we went through last year. And I, I certainly appreciate that. That being said, though, um, I, I hear often out there that, as governor, I don't care about education. And I told all the people sitting here earlier uh, today this. Uh, I think you would agree with me that the number one priority in a budget is whatever gets the most amount in a budget. Education, K through 12 and higher ed, is 40% of the overall budget. The next item on the budget uh, is the social services side at 38.9% 30, uh, of the budget. And so for the many of the people sitting in this room who deal in businesses, I think you understand that at that point in time, uh, the legislature and myself are limited with how much money we have. And I don't want people to have uh, false expectations because we've had a couple months of um, better than anticipated revenue. Uh, even at the rate we're going, we will still be um, approximately, I'm going to ballpark this, about 300 million deficit going into uh, the following year that we ha will have to address. Um, and I know that uh, not only is higher education looking uh, to be replaced, uh, both with the state system and the state related, so is K through 12, and so are the social services, and many, many other categories. So I, I want you uh, to be aware of that as we go forward. Uh, my hope is that we're going to grow the economic uh, pie. Uh, that we'll have more revenues coming in during the course of the next few years and we'll be able to uh, provide additional revenues to education. Uh, but at the same time, I remind us uh, all that just as state government is tightening, tightening its belt, uh, I have to look to everybody to help tighten their belt as we get through these times. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. The last item on the agenda is the photo report on selected construction projects present uh, Ford Stryker. Um, good afternoon. Uh, today I'll report on three capital projects. Uh, the first report is on the status of the Biobehavioral Health Building. The Department of Biobehavioral Health will occupy the majority of the space within the new building. Uh, human Development and Family Studies, the Prevention Research Center, and the Center for Healthy Aging will also be located in this building. The current uh, budget estimate is um, 46.4 million, which is 1.7 million below the authorized amount. For reference, the new building will be located south of Henderson Building between the Old Main and Hub Lawns. I will be showing um, exterior construction photographs from uh, these angles. This is a rendering of the hub lawn side of the building with the hub uh, plaza deck illustrated in the foreground. And this is how it looks now. The hub plaza deck uh, subbase is almost complete in preparation for the installation of granite pavers. And there is a large lecture hall below the deck. And this is the below grade slope lecture hall with auditorium seating for 200 uh, people. 
It will be a general purpose classroom during the day with late afternoon and evening guest lectures. This carpenter is busy making preparations to install window sills on the first floor. Drywall installation is a little more than half finished and prime painting has started over the first three floors. The inside of the building, including the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are moving along quite well. This is a close-up of the north side of the building. These masons are installing starter courses of limestone veneer. The green material is a vapor barrier. This is the architect's rendering of the old main lawn side of the building. Brick and limestone veneer complement Henderson building on the left. The next photo shows the overall progress. Installation of the stone and brick veneers is in progress. This section will receive limestone and this will be brick. The Biobehavioral Health Building is on schedule for a October 2012 completion and overall is 65% complete. The Eva J. Pell Laboratory for Advanced Biological Research at University Park is designed to support immunology and infectious disease research. The new biological research lab site is adjacent to the Amnal Diagnostics Laboratory between Route two, uh, 322 and Fox Hollow Road. This ramp will lead to the first floor main entry on the west side, uh, west facing side of the building as seen on this architectural rendering. This is the entrance ramp on the site. First floor foundation walls and the service dock are almost complete. The steel has arrived and is being erected this week. Plumbing equipment will be located on this lower level with the laboratory spaces above on the first floor. The total project budget is $23 million with approximately $15 million coming from a National Institutes of Health grant from the federal government. The project is 18% complete and the anticipated completion will be in May of 2013. The new Pagula Ice Arena at University Park will be home to Penn State's NCAA Division I men's and women's hockey programs. The arena will also host community youth hockey and recreational skating. The contractors have been working on the excavation of the site and construction of the building's foundations since the end of January. It turns out that the subsurface soil conditions are much different than anticipated. So significantly longer pilings uh, have been required and the foundation design needed to be changed. This resulted in a cost increase of over a million dollars. Additionally, the project team has identified some revenue generation and fan experience enhancements, which are very desirable and will cost an additional $1 million. Since the project is less than 10% complete, we believe the project contingency should be preserved for issues which may emerge um, as construction progresses. Therefore, we've increased our estimates of the project cost by $2 million. Intercollegiate Athletics has confirmed that they will provide funding to cover these cost increases if they're needed. The revised project estimate of $91 million is, in, is within the board authorization of $89 million plus the 10% um, authorized by the uh, uh, standing orders. I will keep you posted on the cost of the project as the work progresses over the next 16 months. The unexpected subsurface conditions delayed the early foundation work and steel erection. At this point, the work's about 10 days behind schedule. The construction manager is working on a recovery schedule and has reported that they plan to complete the arena in September 2013 as scheduled. I will now show some photographs of the work. The arena will be located near the corner of University Drive and Curtin Road across from the Bryce Jordan Center. The main ice rink will have seating for 6,000 spectators and the community ice rink will have seating for 300. Photos of the site work were taken from these three locations. This is the footprint for the community ice rink located on the west end of the arena with Shields building in the background. The rink will be a recreational and educational asset for members of the entire university community as well as for children, youth, and families throughout central Pennsylvania. This is the east side of the site with Haluba Hall in the background. The main sheet of ice will be approximately here. Um, looking along the east wall, you can see the installation of the footings in the foundation walls. As you can see, a large amount of material was excavated. About 10,000 truckloads of clean fill were moved to a site north of Park Avenue. A low spot was identified as an ideal location to accept large quantities of clean fill. This location has several benefits. 
First, it's nearby and it's on campus, which, results in, which has resulted in a comparatively low trucking cost. Secondly, the contouring of this fill will provide a more pastoral setting to this approach to campus. And finally, it'll increase football parking and pasture land near the stadium. The Penn State hockey community celebrated the official groundbreaking ceremony for the Pagula Ice Arena on April 20th. Coaches, fans, and dignitaries gathered to mark the occasion. Thank you, Chair Strumpf, and this concludes my report. Stephanie. Uh, Ford, with regard to the 10-day delay, have they um, asked for any extension of the substantial um, date for completion yet, or are we just hoping that they'll accelerate when the time comes? No, as, uh, they have not asked for an extension. In fact, that's what I uh, spoke about, the recovery schedule. Um, the CM is, is looking at their um, schedule, and they're going to um, accelerate certain parts of the work, and they're going to do that within the funds that we have available in the uh, contract. Ford, uh, with respect to what I believe you termed the community rink, is that what the, the uh, smaller rink uh, outside the main arena will be? It's the rink to the uh, to the west. To the west. Both, okay. they, they actually are both the same size. No, no, I understand. But that, that will be for community youth hockey and, uh, and the like. Uh, uh, I coached 23 teams in youth hockey in my son's careers. And I didn't ever find a locker room that had a larger, large enough hall, a big enough door, and enough places to sit. So for future moms and dads coaching youth hockey at that rink, please make sure that the halls and the doors and the locker rooms in that part of the rink are big enough, number one. That's my advice. Number two, as a youth hockey dad, I pl played in many, or my sons played in many rinks that, was, that were attached to other larger arenas with, with some windows. Where, and I never saw one that actually had that right where it could be useful for the families and the parents and the grandparents to sit comfortably, order a beverage, and watch what's actually happening on a rink. So I just encourage you to try to make that interface between the main rink and the community rink useful for those that are interested in what's on in the community rink. So. Right. In the uh, design 23 years of, or 23 teams of youth hockey coaching gets me those two comments. <laughs> the, the voice of experience. Um, Yes, during the design, actually, both of those issues were addressed, both the number of locker rooms and the size, including the, the doorways so that the goalies can get in and out. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's been incorporated in the design. And in, if you recall from the, uh, may recall from the, when we did the design presentation on this, um, there's a cyber cafe on the, the second floor, which um, basically is going to overlook the community rink, and there's going to be a glass wall there, so there'll be connection between the, the main rink and the community rink, which should pr provide a great venue. So I think you'll be pleased. There being no other items to come before the Committee on Finance, and it still says physical plant here, finance, business, and capital planning, we are adjourned, and Chairman Peach, the committee recommends the adoption of the nine action items projected on the screens. Thank you. you. Thank you, Linda, David, and Ford. Uh, again, the full board is in session. We will take just a moment to review the items on the screen before us. May I have a motion for approval? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. And any, anybody opposed? Okay, the motion carries. So now Jim Broadhurst, uh, who's the chair of the Governance and Long Range Planning Committee, will give a report, please. Thank you, Karen. I would like to note that a quorum of the committee is in attendance at this time, and I will not call the roll. The committee has reviewed and explored its charges since its formation in March. Our committee is responsible for charging and supporting the chief executive with leading a strategic planning process, participating in that process, approving the strategic plan, and mon monitoring its progress. We are very pleased to have Provost Rob Pangborn with us today to provide an update on the implementation of the strategic plan. As you know, in May 2009, the Board of Trustees approved a five-year strategic plan as set forth in the Priorities for Excellence, the Penn State Strategic Plan 2009-10 through 2013-14. The plan builds on the theme of prioritization for excellence, offering strategies for each of seven goals. Achieving these goals requires collaboration among administrators, faculty, staff, and students from academic and administrative units across Penn State 
in making difficult choices regarding future programming. At this time, I would like to ask Dr. Pangborn to comment on the progress to date with a particular focus on the work of the core council that has charged to undertake analysis of academic programs and administrative areas. Dr. Pangborn. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Well, I'm pleased to update you on our progress with the university's five-year strategic plan, which as Jim uh, mentioned, the board adopted in May 2009. As we near the end of the third year of the current planning cycle, we remain committed to enhancing student success and fulfilling the university's mission and goals during a time of increasing fiscal and other challenges. Penn State has had a continuous university-wide strategic planning process for almost 30 years. Since it was formally initiated by then President Bryce Jordan in uh, 1983, strategic planning has involved all the Penn State academic and administrative units and all locations of the university with planning cycles of between three and five years. The process itself has evolved such that it features both bottom-up and top-down elements. Beginning with the plans developed at the unit level, a total of 44 academic and administrative units in all, these then become the foundation for the university level plan. The University Strategic Planning Council had seven task forces appointed to address specific topics such as internationalization and the land-grant mission. It engaged faculty members, administrators, students, and trustees to develop the institution-wide plan for the five-year period from 2009-10 through 2013-14, known as Penn State's Priorities for Excellence. Perhaps one of the most unique elements of this most recent plan is its recommendation to drill down into every budget unit of the university asking that they take a detailed and introspective look at their operations, priorities, aspirations, and opportunities. The Academic Program and Administrative Services Review Core Council is the strategic entity that grew out of that initiative. Composed of 13 senior administrators and faculty, the Core Council was charged with maximizing academic potential, enhancing efficiency, and administrative services, reducing redundancy, freeing resources for higher priority uses, and exploring opportunities for new revenue generation. With the help of these committees and the work spanning 18 months, I'm happy to report that the core council has completed its assignment, and the effort now turns towards carrying out its many recommendations. Further, in the face of the current fiscal constraints, we're taking the lessons learned from the core council's work and moving ahead with a new budget planning task force. The task force just appointed this April will take a long view of the university's budget model and organizational structure. The remainder of my presentation today will focus on not so much on the processes, but more on the outcomes of the strategic planning and the core council efforts. Over the past 20 years, from 1992 to 93, uh, through uh, the, the current academic year, Penn State has centrally recycled and reallocated $233 million. $67 million was recycled in just the past four years. Individual units have been asked to recycle funds internally as well, continually evaluating programs and activities and trimming those th that are of less strategic importance. <laughs> This board has approved 176 academic programs for elimination or merger over the past two decades. As Penn State's enrollment has grown by almost 28% over those same 20 years, an increase of 21,000 students, we have shifted funds and employees from administrative to academic uh, areas and functions as a way to meet the needs of additional students while at the same time controlling costs. You'll recall that there were seven overarching goals in the strategic plan. The goals begin with student success. They emphasize the building blocks of academic excellence and our land-grant mission of research and outreach. 
and conclude with the innovative use of technology to expand access to educational programming as well as strategies for enhanced efficiency and cost control. I'd like to share some of the successes resulting from this current cycle of strategic planning. First, we've made great progress in assessing student, student learning in order to improve curricula and instruction. The university's assessment website includes a multitude of resources and best practices, all drawn from the review of approximately 150 assessment plans submitted by our own four-year programs at Penn State locations. This assessment coordinating committee with uh, leadership from undergraduate education is monitoring our progress on learning assessment. Central to the new approaches uh, to evaluating learning outcomes are the extensive reviews conducted by both faculty and external professionals of capstone projects and e-portfolios created by students that integrate in a very tangible way their conceptual learning from the spectrum of courses that they've taken in their majors. Secondly, we're aware of the important role of the Commonwealth campuses in providing access to education across the state. As baccalaureate programs are developed and offered that meet regional characteristics and demand, we are focused on increasing the number of applicants selecting Commonwealth campuses as their first choice of campus. More important, an increasing number of campuses are now sharing faculty and support staff to offer joint academic programs that expand the options of enrolled students while reducing the aggregate oper operating costs. Two examples of formal cross-campus collaborations include offering of the Administration of Justice major through a consortium of campuses that includes Penn State Beaver, New Kensington, and Shenango and a regional delivery of the College of Engineering's Bachelor of Science in General Engineering through a partnership composed of Philadelphia campuses, Penn State Abington, Penn State Brandywine, and the Great Valley Center. Informal collaborations are also being developed based on new distance teaching and learning technologies, such as video conferencing through the Video Learning Network. Five campuses in the Northeast are collaborating in this way uh, with VLN delivery of a bachelor's de degree program in general business in an evening and weekend format. As noted earlier, a, strat a strategy under goal two, advancing excellence, led directly to the formation of the Academic Program and Administrative Services Review Core Council, which was charged in, in late 2009. Its task was to review units across the university with the goal of identifying efficiencies, cost reductions, and strategic investments that could lead to revenue generation. For about 18 months, the core council worked closely with three committees whose assessments focused on University Park, the campuses, and academic and administrative services. Each of the committees included a broad cross-section of administrators and faculty. In terms of academic recommendations, the core council focused on building on existing strengths, eliminating under-enrolled courses, and phasing out low, enro low enrollment programs. The next step will be to replace the underperforming degree programs with new strategically selected ones that have demonstrated student interest and high prospective de demand from employers. Targeted task groups have recently been charged by the Vice President for Commonwealth Campuses to explore the various options. For instance, considering the substantial cohort of adults in the Commonwealth who have previously earned credits without actually completing a degree, we will be taking steps to identify and match degree offerings and support services for potential degree completion. Online learning as well as resident instruction will be helpful to accommodate adults supporting families and constrained by location or employment schedules. There is growing interest in programs in which students are able to earn a, a baccalaureate degree and a master's degree in five years. One example is the integrated Bachelor of Science in Special Education with the master's degree in Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education. The World Campus is an 
uh, is a major enrollment growth area. Professional master's de degrees with professionally oriented undergraduate degrees <coughs> are fast growing markets in the online education and we're moving rapidly to develop programs responsive to current needs. Undergraduate degrees in business, criminal justice, information sciences and technology, labor and employment relations, and nursing are each enrolling more than 400 students each year. Professional master's degrees in engineering management, software and systems engineering, human resources and employment relations and business continue to grow at a rate of approximately 20% per year. New revenue may also result from comprehensive review and restructuring in continuing education. Planning is underway to integrate continuing education more effectively with broader campus program planning and delivery, rebalancing credit and non-credit programming, and organizing the offerings on a re regional rather than a campus by campus basis. A new budget model to revitalize the University Park summer session was in, implemented this past year. The new model encourages colleges to take more student demand or a more student demand oriented approach to scheduling of courses and delivery of, of courses that have innovative character. In fact, results from the first year of this project have shown an increase of 585 enrolled students and a 49% growth in the student credit hour generation. As we approach the end of the third year of the, of the strategic planning cycle, every one of the 44 unit heads has received an individualized letter from the provost with specific core council recommendations. The units have had the opportunity to respond to the recommendations and are to report periodically to the provost on their progress implementing them. Meanwhile, we continue to monitor the status of the multi-year goals of the strategic plan. These include initiatives to identify optimal ba an optimal balance and distribution of core services, such as human resources, continuing education, career services, and information technology. We're documenting our progress in providing op open access to the inf information through the Office of Planning and Institutional Assessments website. Performance indicators are tied to the various goals in order to identify measurable impacts and trends. Similar to the strategic plan goals, a companion webpage collects the core council letters for each of the academic units, either at University Park or the Commonwealth campuses, and for the academic support and administrative service units. Recognizing the ch challenging schedule you're on this afternoon, I'll simply refer you to the many examples of the action items coming out of the core council that can be found on this website. They include anticipating the the uh, rapidly changing needs of students and faculty in regard to computing, communication, and learning spaces and technology, and how we will address those emerging needs. Exploratory opportunities relating to the ways students access and move among our various campuses. And finally, introduction of modern approaches for adaptive, self-paced skill advancement that can reduce the time spent on developmental courses for students who need that extra assistance. Looking ahead to the next year, we'll continue with the fourth year implementation of the strategic plan and to monitor our annual pro uh, progress and performance data for both the strategic plan and the core council recommendations. Typically, unit level strategic planning begins a year before the la last year of the current university-wide planning cycle. That would have meant starting the next round of unit planning this coming fall. However, to better, better accommodate the presidential search schedule, schedule and give the new president an opportunity to influence development of the overall strategic plan during his or her first year in office, the next cycle will be postponed for one year to commence in 2013-14. We will be busy in the interim. As I indicated earlier, continuing budget challenge has, challenges have motivated the formation of a budget planning task force, 
that President Erickson has charged to undertake a comprehensive study of our budget model, operations, and structure. The report is expected by late fall. David Gray, Senior Vice President for Finance and Business, and I will co-chair the task force, which will draw its membership from the Board of Trustees, administration, campus chancellors, college deans, faculty, and students. In summary, we've made good progress with year three strategies. The lengthy and comprehensive core council effort is bearing fruit in streamlined programs, improved learning assessment, new integrated undergraduate graduate programs, more efficient procedures, and a host of cost savings, mostly derived from administrative uh, operations. We remain focused on the student experience and our responsibility to offer quality academic programs. We've received excellent cooperation from all corners of the university, including participation by trustees who served on our strategic planning committees and who will contribute as members of the new budget planning task force. I'd be happy to answer your question in any time that remains. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pangborn, for that report. Um, you touched upon the Northeast Video Network, uh, which is being utilized as a unique delivery method uh, for certain courses. Do you know how many courses are currently being offered through the network uh, to students, and uh, has it facilitated an increase in enrollment for these under-enrolled courses? Uh, well, I, I think I'm going to uh, look for Craig. Uh, can you tell us how many you have uh, recruited? This is for the uh, virtual learning network which is a new method for providing access to students at a distance. Yeah, we've just implemented this about, uh, I think about 18 sites now, but it's so early that we really have not, have not uh, data that we can report yet, but it will provide a tremendous opportunity where you can use multiple sites that uh, address the, uh, the, fa the problem with low, low enrolled courses, particularly the junior and senior level. I think in the next meeting I'll be able to provide a further report, though. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Pangborn. In fulfillment of its governance responsibilities, our committee is also charged to provide counsel and advice to the board in matters concerning the development of strategies, policies, and practices that orient, educate, organize, motivate, and assess the performance of trustees. Other responsibilities include oversight of all committee guidelines to ensure appropriate and comprehensive distribution of responsibilities. We are in the process of reviewing those guidelines and should be able to report in July if any changes are recommended. We also are reviewing the expectations of membership, which were put in place several years ago, as well as the code of conduct for all trustees. We are also reviewing the orientation materials for new trustees. This is of particular importance as we anticipate several new members joining us. We want to make sure that they are fully immersed and up to speed when their terms begin in July. We are also engaged in dialogue with the University Faculty Senate Special Committee on University Governance. We have common goals of examining the structure, functions, practices, and responsibilities of the board in our interactions with constituent groups. We look forward to an exchange of ideas for continued enhancement of the effectiveness of our board and the university. Other items that we're looking at include re revisiting term limits, we currently have 15-year term limits for members elected by the alumni, by agricultural societies, and by the board representing business and industry endeavors. Is it too long, too short, or about right? We're exploring several models and hope to come back to the board with our findings and recommendations within the next few months. Coupled with term limits, we are also reviewing the role of emeriti trustees and how we can best utilize the expertise this group offers. We'd be happy to take any questions. I don't, um, um, no. No, no questions from the audience today. Thank you for those com that comment. We, 
we have had uh, with the faculty uh, senate uh, with Larry Backer, who's I think here with us today, uh, also with John Nichols, who's uh, heading up this special committee. We have had discussions in regards to enhancing our communications between both groups. Any other questions? There being no other items to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Yeah, and uh, I would add to that that in July we expect to have both faculty and students on our committees. Uh, they'll begin that activity then. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you to Jim and to Rob Pangborn. So finally, the Outreach, Development, and Community Relations Committee is chaired by Mark Dambly. Mark? Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm sure there's some advantages to going last. Some folks will be interested in me moving along very quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. I'd like to note that a quorum for the committee is in attendance at this time, so I'll not call on a roll call of our committee. I would like to acknowledge uh, my vice chair, Paul Suey, uh, Richard Allen, Stephanie Davini, Betsy Huber, David Jones, Rodney Erickson, and, and obviously Karen Peets for their participation. Uh, I'm going to touch just on three items very quickly this evening, or this, I feel like this evening, uh, this afternoon. Uh, the, the first, uh, we've been working really, really hard, uh, our committee along with the other committees, and I want to uh, commend uh, Karen and Keith on their leadership in engaging uh, the board uh, as a whole uh, to try and make uh, some progress on some of the things we need to do. Uh, the first thing I want to report on is the hiring of the Edelman team. Uh, in late April, uh, Edelman and Latour Communications were retained to immediately support the university in corporate communications uh, media relations and stakeholder engagement. A significant portion of their scope of services is to assist the university in changing the conversation and moving the university forward consistent with our core mission and values. We thought it would be helpful to provide some information regarding the prof process following the identif identification of the important partner in our communications engagement. The Committee on Outreach, Development, and Community Relations uh, since we're new, we don't have an old one to mess it up with, uh, was charged with developing strategies for improving efforts of the university's messaging. Element was identified as the firm of choice and came with outstanding recommendations. Uh, I want to note that uh, the committee spent a lot of time uh, interviewing a number of firms and doing a lot of due diligence and personal calls and references uh, in this selection. Edelman was successfully worked, uh, has successfully worked with both Duke University, Yale University, and Stanford University uh, in times of recent media crisis. The Edelman team is a, a first-rate firm that will be with us on the campus for an extended period of time. Uh, as of today, they have a number of, uh, of uh, staff embedded in the university uh, currently. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with them and President Erickson and the administration uh, and working to advance the university's messaging. So uh, we're really delighted uh, to have them on board, and, and I think uh, we'll see the fruits of their, their labors uh, in, in short order. Uh, two other items that uh, we're exploring, uh, and actually to address the gentleman who, who just spoke. Uh, first is a new Board of Trustees website uh, has been developed, uh, and uh, I got an email while we were sitting here that uh, Bill Mann has told me it'll be up and running on Monday. So we're excited about that. Some, some uh, enhancements to that have been information uh, on our new committees uh, in terms of their purpose and their structure, uh, information on the, board of, on the Board of Trustees and its purpose. Lots of folks ask who we are, what we do, and why we're, why we're here. Uh, videos of the, of the Board of Trustees meetings, which, which will be available to us in short order at, at the conclusion of the meeting. And there'll be a question and answer section. Uh, we have uh, received some legitimate criticism for our inability to respond to the uh, numerous requests of questions and, uh, that have been posed to us. So we're putting in place with the Edelman Group uh, a structure by which questions can be asked directly of the Board of Trustees and responded to in a timely manner. And then one last item, which I think is quite interesting, uh, is the history of the board. Uh, having been on the board for about a year and a half, I didn't even know all the history. And there's a great picture of Jesse there uh, back in his days as an All-American uh, uh, basketball player. So uh, we're really excited about the new website. I think you'll see it. it's much more interactive. Uh, it's much more informative. And I think it'll be responsive to, to uh, our constituencies yearning for more information. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about uh, was a crisis management plan. Uh, the Board of Trustees uh, found ourselves without a crisis management plan uh, in November. Uh, we felt ill-equipped to deal with the issues that came upon us, so we have taken upon ourselves uh, to establish a crisis management plan, develop it uh, specifically for the Board of Trustees, uh, and we'll be rolling that, hopefully, rolling that out hopefully in July. I think that will assist us that if we ever have a crisis of this order of magnitude, 
that we won't find ourselves in the position we did previously. Okay, so I'd be happy to answer any questions from the board. Having heard none, we're moving on, so we all go home. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Mark, and uh, special thanks to that committee for locating Edelman, engaging them, and I think we're going to be in uh, much better shape. Okay, so uh, Council Baldwin, is there a report on legal matters? Yes, there is, Chair Pete. Okay. Um, today you have approved the assignment of the ground lease on the land on which the village of Penn State is located. Uh, you may remember discussions and communications about the MOU that had to be executed prior to the sale of assets and bankruptcy. And then there was a presentation on continuing negotiations in March. Um, so thank you for approving the assignment and amendment today. And Trustee Lubert, you were absolutely right. Um, we're not getting any more money, but we're not getting any less. So thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are in the process of completing the licensing agreement for the continued use of the name Penn State and the single logo that has previously been used. The entire process should be completed no more than the end of June. Although the university itself has been served with no further subpoenas by the Office of Attorney General, several of our employees have been served with subpoenas due to the positions that they hold with the university. The Board of Trustees, in conjunction with President Erickson, decided that although there is no requirement under the bylaws that they will exercise the discretion as allowed and pay the attorney fees for those employees who choose to be accompanied by an attorney. Thus far, we have received and processed eight requests. Last month, in addition to giving telephone and email advice, handling requests for information, attending meetings, doing document and policy review. The Office of General Counsel drafted over 125 documents, including contracts, affiliation, and employment agreements. That's the report. Thank you, Chair Preetz. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Next, I'd like to call on Dan Hagen. Yes, Carl, sorry. Uh, just a question about the legal matter that we're providing uh, legal counsel to those people if they wish it and that is that covered by our insurance? Yes, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dan Hagen was up once and uh, he's the immediate past chair of the University Faculty Senate uh, for a report on this year's activities of that body. Dan's professor of dairy and animal sciences in the College of Agricultural Sciences. Dan. Thank you very much, Chair Peets. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the activities of the Faculty Senate for the 2011-12 academic year, which will likely be remembered as one of the most unusual and stressful Senate years ever. Several pieces of legislation were passed and additional courses that had not been offered for five or more years were dropped per Senate policy. Senate Council reviewed reorganization proposals developed in response to the core council recommendations, as Provost uh, recently mentioned. Uh, units that submitted the proposals included agricultural sciences, arts and architecture, liberal arts, and Great Valley. We anticipate additional proposals for reorganization and changes in courses and majors will be submitted as colleges and campuses continue to respond to those recommendations perhaps triggered by further concerns about the state appropriation for the university. This was the first year for a new Senate committee, Global Programs, which sponsored a report by Vice Provost Michael Adewumi on the extensive involvement of Penn State faculty and students in Global Programs. It was also the first year for the Library's Information Science and Technology Committee, which was formed by merging the former libraries and computer and information systems committees. The Senate officers visit about one third of the other campuses and one third of the University Park academic units each year. This year, eight campuses, Altoona, Fayette, Hazleton, Mes Medicine, Schuylkill, Wilkesbury, Worthington Scranton, and Penn College, and five University Park colleges or units, Law, education, earth and mineral sciences, engineering, and the graduate school were visited.
During those visits, the officers meet separately with groups of students, faculty, and administrators to learn about issues of concern at each campus or college and about the programs and culture of individual units. Reports on the campus and college visits were presented at the January and March Senate meetings respectively. Several new working groups or task forces were established during the year to address specific issues that were beyond the charges of the 15 standing Senate committees. An internships task force was charged in the fall to examine issues surrounding internship experiences. Their report, based on surveys of programs, faculty, and students, was presented at the April Senate meeting. The working group on general education was developed collaboratively with the Office of the Vice President for Undergraduate Education and the Interim Provost to examine the purpose of general education from a macro view. Dr. Jeremy Cohen, Associate Vice President and Senior Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, is a convener of that group. A report on the group's findings and recommendations is expected soon. A task force on honor code and academic integrity was charged to study revisions to the academic integrity policy and the concept of developing a university-wide honor code. The group's report has been received and the chair and co-chair of the task force have met with several constituency groups to discuss the issue. Those groups have generally been supportive of developing an honor code or statement of conduct. So an expanded committee with broader representation, including students, will be charged to develop a statement of conduct and academic integrity and review existing policies on those issues. A special committee on university governance, chaired by Emeritus Professor and former Senate Chair John Nichols, as was mentioned previously, is going to be studying the structure, function, and purpose of the University Board of Trustees in relationship to its interactions with the various constituency groups of the university. That committee includes faculty, an administrator, a student, and a staff member, and they've been asked to submit a report by the end of this summer. The report should include their findings and suggestions on any ways to enhance interaction and flow of information between university constituency groups and the board. <coughs> of course, the Sandusky scandal had a major effect on the morale, workflow, and level of anxiety of the Senate and its committees, and it created a backlog of reports that gradually was worked through Senate meetings. Three special meetings of Senate Council, which serves as the executive committee of the Senate, and one special Senate meeting were held. During the special Senate meeting on November 18th, the Senate passed a resolution that called for majority representation by outside individuals on the Special Invest Investigative Committee, later named the Special Investigations Task Force, as we know, which was not named until November 21st. During a forensic session held as part of the December 6th Senate meeting to discuss the scandal, two motions were made and seconded. By rule, those motions were considered at the January 24th Senate meeting. A motion to summarize the forensic session and to charge appropriate committees passed. A motion from Senate Council to investigate the actions of the Board of Trustees was defeated, as was a motion to have a vote of no confidence in the Board. Another outcome of the scandal was an agreement by administration and the Senate officers to increase the frequency of meetings of the Faculty Advisory Committee to the University President. That committee, comprising the Senate officers and three elected faculty, meets with the President and Provost to discuss issues of mutual concern. The External Matters Subcommittee of Senate Council met with the Office of Public Information to explore ways for the Senate to collaborate on emphasizing academic and research accomplishments of faculty, staff, and students. Since late January, Chair Peets and Vice Chair Mosser have met with the Senate Chair, the Senate Officers, and the Committee Chairs, and the full Senate to listen to ideas and answer questions. The Senate appreciated those opportunities to speak with the Board leadership and hopes that conversations between the Board and the Senate will continue in the future. Other issues were addressed by the Senate this year. Legislation on courses with a travel component was considered but returned to committee. Follow-up discussions of the Registrar's Office, Undergraduate Education, the Graduate School, and the Senate continue on implementing changes in course offerings that involve travel and courses that previously extended beyond the end of a semester. The Senate collaborated with Student Affairs 
to encourage faculty to encourage their students not to participate in the State Paddy's Day event in March. The Senate office continues to look for ways to trim costs. With support from the provost's office, new enhanced video conferencing equipment was installed in the Senate suite. The new equipment enables more sites to connect via video conference for meetings. For example, all campuses participated excuse me, via video conference in an ombudsperson workshop and 28 faculty representing 19 campuses participated via video conference in a faculty governance meeting. These video conferences eliminate both the direct costs of travel and travel time for the participants while increasing the flexibility of scheduling meetings. In addition, meetings of Senate Council and when feasible, meetings of various committees and task forces that involve faculty from other campuses are held via video conference and or audio conference. Faculty senators located at other campuses are encouraged to participate in meetings via technology and all senators can participate in plenary Senate sessions via media site. The challenges of this year increase the workload for the Senate staff and the executive director, Dr. Susan Utes. Their professionalism and dedication were instrumental in helping the Senate to move forward and accomplish much despite difficult circumstances. The April 24th Senate meeting involved consideration of several legislative and informational reports, announcement of the results of the annual Senate elections, the seating of the chair-elect Brent Yarnell, who was a faculty member in Earth and Mineral Sciences, and Secretary Pam Huffnagel, who was re-elected as secretary. She's a faculty member as, at Du Bois campus. And then we had the transition of officers to end the Senate year. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide this brief review. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes, Ed. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Were the, are the reports available where you have listed colleges and various units around state? Yes, those are part of the Senate record. They're available online. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Ken. I don't have a question, but I'd just like to say that I had the opportunity to work with Dan during uh, the course of this year, and I just want to thank you publicly for your work as a liaison with the faculty during what was undoubtedly an unprecedented, difficult, contentious year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I was definitely going to say the same thing. It's been wonderful working with Dan, and you could not imagine a more stressful year as a, as a leader among peers. And we're off to a very good start with Larry Backer. We've met with him a couple of times, and we have agreed to have some informal meetings with different faculty and staff as we look forward. We agreed with Larry that that was a good idea. Okay, um, our next agenda item relates to the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. We received the annual update of the Medical Center in March, so we'll proceed with the annual appointment of members of its board of directors. As noted in the agenda, there are 15 members on the board. Nine are appointed directly by this board with three-year staggered terms. Two are ex officio members and four are independent directors that are self-perpetuating. This year of the nine appointed by the board of trustees, three directors' terms will expire. We have a res rev resolution for us to appoint Dave Joyner, Ted Junker, and Barry Robinson as members of the Board of Directors of the Hilt Milton S. Hershey Medical Center for three-year terms ending June 30th, 2015. May I have a motion for approval? Second. Second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries, thank you. So, as many of you know this year, we have had unprecedented interest in the election of trustees by the alumni. We are extremely fortunate to have 86 individuals express a desire to become more engaged and involved in the university through service as a trustee. There are numerous ways to serve our university through volunteer efforts with the, with the colleges and campuses, through advocacy work in our communities, 
and by serving as ambassadors of the university. We are pleased that so many want to engage with us as we work to define our future path. As I mentioned, there's been an unprecedented interest in the election this year, with over 37,000 alumni participating in the voting process. Due to this great interest, we engaged the firm of KPMG to observe the tabulation of the ballots, which occurred yesterday after the voting concluded at 9 a.m. I'd now like to call on Trustee Davini for the report of that tabulation. Thank you, Chairwoman Peets. Uh, Jim Broadhurst and I served as the judges for the alumni election for the Board of Trustees. The number of electors assigned passwords to participate in the election was 197,517. The total number of ballots received was 37,579. I will now read the total number of votes for the three candidates receiving the highest number of votes. First, Adam J. Telefero, 15,629. Second, Anthony P. Lebrano, 10,096. Third, Ryan J. McCombie, 4,806. The results of the tabulation of all 86 candidates will be posted publicly in the near future. The three individuals elected by the alumni to serve as trustees for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2012 are Adam Telefero, Anthony Lebrano, Ryan B. McCombie. This is the end of my report. May I have a motion for approval of the report? Okay, may I have a second? second? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Moving on to the agricultural delegate election, I served as chair of that meeting yesterday. I'm pleased to report a great deal of interest from that constituent group as well. There was a total of five candidates who indicated their willingness to serve as trustee. I'm pleased to report that Carl Schaefer and Donald Kotner were nominated and elected by the agricultural delegates to serve for three-year terms beginning July 1st. May I have a motion for approval of that report? Second? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Each member of the Board of Trustees was sent a communication from Paula Ammerman forwarding the recommendation from the Selection Group on Business and Industry Trustees. In accordance with Standing Order 7, the Selection Group, composed of five members of the Board, annually provides the names of two candidates for confirmation by the Board of Trustees for election as trustees, <coughs> representing business and industry endeavors. The candidates submitted for confirmation for three-year terms beginning July 1st are Ken Frazier and Ed Hintz. A resolution has been distributed to you and is projected on the screen. May I have a motion for approval? Second? Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, anybody opposed? Okay, the motion carries. I do have a few announcements today. Congratulations to Trustees Frazier, Hintz, and Schaefer on your reelection. You're great colleagues in our governance of Penn State and we look forward to our continued work together. This is also the last meeting for several of our colleagues. I'd like to take a few moments to thank Trustees Dee Bernardinus, who actually isn't here, Hetherington, Jones, and Riley for their tremendous dedication and loyal service to Penn State. As I noted before, there are many As I noted before, there are many, many ways to connect and engage with the university, and we know that we'll see all of you again and soon. We'd like to take this opportunity to ask each of you to make a few remarks. We'll start with Boots. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I want to say congratulations to you and Keith for the job you've done in these last couple of months. I, I know talking with Keith, he spends hours upon hours upon hours on, 
only imagine you're spending even more hours than he is. So I think the two of you have done a great job, and I want to commend you. Uh, I, I want to say thanks to Rod Erickson. Thanks for being there, Rod, when we needed you. And thanks for saying yes when we asked you. And finally, uh, when I first got on the board, I replaced Charlie Brocious. I said, Charlie, uh, what can you give me for advice? He said, well, Boots, my best advice is if you need advice, call Paula. So, Paul, I want to say thank you for all you've done for me. So. Thank you, Boots. How about you, Dave Jones? Well, thanks, Karen. I'd like to thank the Penn State alumni who elected me five times to this board and Paula Ammerman and her staff for their support, patience, and forbearance <laughs> over these past 15 years. Um, I was reminded uh, earlier today when I ran into Charlie Brocious that when he left the board, he reminded me that I was then the oldest member of the board, <laughs> which I thought was a very generous thing for him to do. But serving on this board has been one of the greatest satisfactions of my life. My mind has been stretched, and Mary Lee, who's back there, and I have made wonderful acquaintances among board members, administrators, faculty, and students who've worked successfully over these years to raise the academic stature and national profile of Penn State. Many board members have come, as did we, from modest circumstances. The depth with which they have shared so generously of their time and treasure to give back to Penn State deserves our appreciation. Who could have believed when I came in 1950 from a small town in the coal fields of Fayette County to be one of 11,000 students at the Pennsylvania State College that I would one day have the honor of serving on the board of trustees of the great Pennsylvania State University with its 95,000 students. And who could have believed when I decided nearly three years ago not to run again for election because I feel 15 years is sufficient tenure that Penn State would be facing the challenges it now faces. I guess I have a reputation on this board for asking a lot of questions. As you know, I have sometimes questioned the actions of the Penn State administration and the board. But I want to say now that I admire the way this board, galvanized by events in November, has done the right thing, acting swiftly, decisively, and unanimously to respond to this challenge. So as I leave this board after 15 rewarding years, I'm gratified to be able to say that I feel that Penn State is in good hands. And despite the challenges we face today, I'm confident Penn State will learn from this crisis, emerge stronger, and become an even greater university in the years ahead. Thanks for the privilege of serving Penn State. Great. Ann Riley, would you like to say something? Thank you. As a trustee, I've had the good fortune to serve one university geographically dispersed, a land-grant university with its threefold mission of teaching, research, and service, my university. As an English teacher who is a lifelong learning advocate for students of all ages, I am grateful to have learned so much myself about each college and each campus. Now I have a better understanding of what each has to offer, not only in degree programs, but also in the research and outreach, beneficial to the Commonwealth and the entire world. If I can, now I will continue to tell, in active voice, our Penn State story in writing, speaking, and conversation. And when I am doing that, I'll remember Penn State's impressive history and accomplishments I'll remind myself and my audiences how far we have come and especially how much more we have to do and can do with the needed resources. I have the whole Penn State community to thank today for making my trustee service so invigorating and so much fun. But I say with special affection and gratitude a warm thank you to the Penn State staff of everywhere, from physical plant and landscaping to the staff in all the offices of the university 
to the university fleet for being the glue that holds this vast institution together. You helped me to feel useful. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. And thank you all. So before we adjourn, I'd like to note two schedule-related items. For those trustees participating in commencement ceremonies, if you're participating in a commencement at University Park, your robes have been distributed to you. If you're participating in another campus or college, your robes will be available at that location. If you did not receive a robe and were expecting one, please see Paula. <laughs> Also, for those trustees who are participating in the Shriers Honors College Medal Ceremony later this afternoon, that ceremony begins at 5 o'clock in Eisenhower Auditorium. Are there any other matters to come before the board? Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah,